I think my best advice is is just do it, no matter if someone's paying you or not. Thank you, Theo, for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. Would you please tell me a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Theo Van Ruy, and uh, I work as an applied scientist, a senior applied scientist at Amazon. And I've been working in, in machine learning and AI and uh, quantitative analysis um, since it really has been a field in the in the early 2000s. Uh, <clears throat> my, my background is in applied math and theoretical math and uh and yeah i uh, i started coming into the uh kind of big data and computing world um 15 20 years ago so i live here in colorado um i happen to sort of you know be in luck with the uh with the market over here that there's there's enough kind of tech work and enough work to employ me but also it uh, has got you know good recreation activities with skiing and uh camping and biking and um and even recently taking up dirt biking so that's that's yeah. uh, about me yeah yeah that's awesome so yeah t- tell me how you actually got into it because like yeah. when, when i think about data scientists when i think about like machine learning and ai i'm like yeah i know what kind of you know data sets they're providing or i know what they're sort of doing but I don't know where they started. Like, what what major did they go into? You know, yeah. what's the thing they study? You know, and all those kind of stuff. Yeah, I um, in a way, I sort of lucked into the field. Um, it happened to be emerging at the same time that I was coming out of school. Um, and, and really, actually, I was maybe maybe five to ten, maybe maybe five ish years early on it. Um, and I had some great professors who, with with a small liberal arts college, my my graduating class in mathematics was small. Uh, they encouraged me to just pick up grad school, and so I did. And um, because very few people go into uh, things like applied mathematics, which is uh, applied mathematics is different than theoretical mathematics in mm-hmm. that uh, it's largely about solving. Uh, really difficult equations using computers to approximate solutions to them. Um, and so it's, it's on one hand, finding ways to approximate solutions to these really hard math problems. And on the other hand, it's developing computing techniques to get faster and faster at them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how I ended up going into grad school for applied math. Uh, now from there, um, a lot of the applied math world is focused on things that that actually ended up not being that interesting to me, like mm-hmm. weather prediction and weather modeling. Mm-hmm. It, it never quite got my attention, but what did get my attention was more of the um, theoretical statistics and applied statistics. Uh, and applied statistics at that time was sort of the leading candidate for machine learning. Most of the uh, artificial intelligence at that time was very restricted to um one very small aspect of of human intelligence Mm -hmm. and uh uh, the the models being used at that time were um very much in the realm of like a statistical method that was used to to learn a very specific process uh and it might be in that case um something like stock market price Mm -hmm. prediction uh, modeling a time series and the, the variations in the time series and so on. Um, and so that, 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 and then the operations research field, which is about uh, yeah. optimizing uh, a process like mm-hmm. a transportation network. Um, those became really interesting to me as well. Gotcha. And that's basically how I got started in that field. Can you, can you maybe briefly um, share what was the interview process look like? Because like, I mean, I, I know what's it like for, let's say, a marketing person, yeah. product person, program person. But like, I, I don't really have an idea of like, what would the interview process would look like for a senior applied scientists? Yeah, it's pretty yeah. much the same. Um, it's similar, uh, but but interestingly, um, there's a couple components to the senior scientist position at Amazon that that you wouldn't really get elsewhere. Um, so the first thing is obviously, uh, you know, uh, high level interviews with with usually like a like a, a senior program manager. 
looking to Phil's, you know, spot on the team, uh, because applied scientists are, are pretty rare. They usually bring in kind of a higher level person to, uh-huh. to interview them. Um, and then an initial uh, phone screen revolving around a technical subject. Usually it's about uh, a very light coding problem. Hmm. And I couldn't tell you what my coding problem was, but it was a, yeah. it was a, a pretty, pretty straightforward one. Mm-hmm. The next uh, layer or level of the interviewing process was actually to you know, set up the traditional kind of six interviews mm-hmm. uh, across Amazon, three of which... Now, four of which were technical interviews. Oh, wow. Um, some with other senior scientists, uh, some with other senior engineers. Okay. And the goal for the applied scientist uh, interview process is to establish two things. One, their, their depth and breadth of science understanding. So to uh-huh. find an area of expertise for that scientist uh, that they can go deep on. And then in breadth, how many of the fields in science do they know? Uh, the second thing that that we want to establish is whether they meet an engineering bar. Uh-huh. Can the applied scientist function as an engineer equivalent? Um, mm-hmm. So there's a lot of coding uh, interviews uh, in, yeah. in that respect and a lot of technical infrastructure type interviewing. The last thing that differentiates the senior scientist interview process from a, a traditional scientist uh, process is writing samples. Um, mm-hmm. And so I had to produce uh, a two-page written document, uh, and I believe it was detailing one of the most significant projects I've worked on in the last 15 years. And yeah. then the interviewer was a, um, like a director level, like an eight level, sure. uh, who had me present this document to them. And as you know, <laughs> at Amazon, um, there's a lot of, you know, two or six page document yeah. reviews. And it was for that purpose that in all these two and six page document review programs, if you can't write well, then you'll never succeed in these meetings. So uh, part of the interview process was proving that I could thrive. Communicate and- well with the senior levels. Yeah. So what do you do as a senior apply scientist? <laughs> what would you say you do here? Um, <laughs> So it, it really is three parts. Uh, um, at this point, as a senior applied scientist, I do less of the uh, day-to-day uh, coding work. Um, but it is more um, establishing programs and lines of productive research and engineering. Um, and so the, the, the thing that I uh, kind of like to say about it is that it's a triangulation process. Amazon really focuses on near-term results. Um, I would say probably 75%. 75% is near-term results. For the basic reason that if it doesn't work now, it probably won't work later either, right? And, uh, you know, maybe it would work later if you poured in a trillion dollars of resources. But, you know, a a small-scale sample of working now is better than, than something that works later. So, so, the, so there's a lot of focus on what can we get in three to six months, given where we are now to meet this customer need and solve this customer problem. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the first thing that, that I do is, is actually to understand what the customer problems are and mm-hmm. to meet with uh, the PMs, the product managers or mm-hmm. project managers and the business leaders and stakeholders to understand what exactly we are trying to do. Mm-hmm. And why, and and what customer need that mm-hmm. that is addressing. Um, the second thing is so so we sort of have the business end of the triangle, if you will, triangle business on top. Um, the second leg of it is this engineering aspect. Let's say that we had a perfect science solution for it, and and I'm already in mind, kind of two or three different areas of science research that that I might be applying uh, to this this customer problem what would it take to engineer this? Um, mm-hmm. And given that I know a decent amount of backend and en- engineering, uh, I'm, I'm now roughly estimating some of the costs behind it and some of the efforts and, and the amount of time it takes, the complexity mm-hmm. and the complexity and robustness. So a lot of 
scientific solutions can be really complex and really effective, but really prone to breaking, very fragile, mm-hmm. very difficult to implement, very difficult to maintain. So we want to choose, at least in the beginning, solutions that are maintainable and, and, uh, and, and robust. Um, so given now my business and engineering constraint that I've identified, now it is looking at which of the courses of research will actually produce this ideal scientific solution. Mm-hmm. So I know roughly the area that I think will produce a good solution, uh, but I'm not totally sure, right? Mm-hmm. Like I haven't actually run the calculations. I haven't run the data. I don't know that it's possible. And I don't know what the edge cases are. I don't mm-hmm. know what will what it will miss on. That's a big problem. So I may know, for instance, that I can develop, uh, you know, there's a famous example of the Microsoft chatbot mm-hmm. scientist uh, developed it. It actually worked really well in the lab. What they didn't know is that people on Twitter are terrible and they were going to throw all kinds of garbage at the at the chatbot <laughs> and it would learn it would become a racist chatbot right mm. a racist and, and sexist chatbot uh and that's a famous example but but that's really where um the job of the research science comes in is to understand where the risks are mm-hmm. what can go wrong with it what would be a- appropriate to put out now you know should i put out a suboptimal solution that is less risky for instance and maybe restrict my problem to just one category so now that i sort of have the viable science path the engineering constraints the business objective uh now as a senior scientist i'm outlining the options the the most likely productive course of research and engineering Mm -hmm. developing milestones and roadmaps Mm -hmm. And working with project managers to align resources to, mm-hmm. to carry out this course of action. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So was um, so what is what is the part that you'd like the most about your job? And um, if you're comfortable, what's probably not the, you know, the least part that you like about your job? Yeah, I'll tell you the, the part I like most. Um, and, and you and I got to work on this a couple of years ago is when you have done all this legwork and there's a huge amount of legwork involved, you know, pulling data, uh, running it through models, cleaning it, predicting on it, modeling it, uh, projecting what you think the out, you know, final kind of outcome will be on your KPIs, working with engineering, getting it implemented, or, you know, working with the business stakeholders to, to actually get it into production. And the best part is like, a week or so, two weeks after you launch it, you've gathered your data and it looks awesome. And you can tell you're having a customer impact. You know that like you've impacted your stakeholders, your engineering is working, your model is working and things are uh, looking right. And, and that feeling of like, man, I did all this legwork. I, I had my theory, I, I researched it. My analysis showed it was gonna be good. Uh, and now I put it in front of a customer and it actually made a positive impact on a customer. Mm-hmm. Even if it's this tiny, so like I think about like advertising, you make advertising 10% more effective and you go from one click per thousand to like two clicks per thousand. Mm-hmm. And you think, well, <laughs> that's only like one more click, you know, per thousand people. But um, it's two times the... But it's two times, right? You found one more person, one more person <laughs> that like needed that. Yeah. And on the flip side, you also like eliminated an ad that they didn't want to see. Um, uh, it's small, okay. But but for a thousand people, it's a small effect. For a million people, now this is this is a thousand extra people that you've affected. Mm-hmm. For a hundred million people, it's a hundred thousand people, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, at scale, these big data systems are 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 fun to see that. that yeah, yeah. Impact. So, um, now the part that I don't like about it, um, I would say it's this: there's still a part of me, as as long as I've been in the industry and knowing how practically focused most of it is, results in three to six months is is what I would say the bottom is. Uh, there's still a part of me that really enjoys working on something for like two years and really mm-hmm. getting into the, the, the depths of it. Yeah. Understanding the problem fully. Yeah. 
applying the highest power, most complex, you know, solution to it. Um, that type of leisurely academic pursuit <laughs> yeah. is for a totally different era yeah. um, and, and for a different, you know, job type, basically. Makes sense. Yeah. So having to give up uh, precision and full accuracy and, and the full complexity of my solution for something that works is difficult. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I've had to practice a lot over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's something that requires leaving, leaving my personal ego out of, out of the equation. Yeah. Um, and that's really hard to do. Uh, yeah. um, I mean, there's always pros and cons uh, come together. So <laughs> um, I think this will be my last question. But advice for those who want to um, get into this field, like what what would you, let's say, give a you know college student or even like a high school student or anyone honestly uh, who doesn't really have any experience in this field yeah. to you know um, get into the scientist world? I think my best advice is is just do it no matter if someone's paying you or not. Um, don't, don't wait for someone to hand you a project that's well outlined and that will make an impact and that will be well paid and so on. Um, if you're having trouble finding that, go to anybody who needs, needs help in, in doing it. Um, first, no one's going to really understand what you're talking about anyways. Uh, they'll, they'll see you as some sort of genius magic maker and, and maybe they just need help. Right. So you can go to like, you know, if your neighbor runs like a gas station or, or a convenience store, I can guarantee that you can find a problem to solve for them. Um, and, and I would say, uh, start solving it and start, solve it as quickly and simply as you can. Um, because that, that will be 90% of all solutions. Uh, but you know, yeah, don't 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 wait around. Just just go out there and jump in there and do it. There's an infinite amount of data on the internet, um, and in various places that you can you can grab it from. The tools available, computing wise, today are tremendous. Uh, just just the progress on the tools alone is uh, is yeah. crazy over the last twenty years. Um, so just go jump in and do it. See what comes out of it. Yeah. And, and eventually you'll find people who will pay you to do it and who will, who will give you an opportunity to make. Yeah. 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 No, no. I, I love that answer. Just, just do it. Yeah. That's what I always tell people who ask me, like, how do you, how do you start a YouTube channel? You know what? Just, <laughs> right. just, just pull up your phone and record it and then just like upload it. Look at my yeah. first video. It's crappy as it's, it's probably the most crappy video that you ever see, but you know, uh, it gets you somewhere. I saw a guy, I, I thought his advice was brilliant. Um, so I was telling you earlier that I, I used to do a lot of music writing, a lot yeah. of songwriting writing and production. And I listened back to some of my first songs. They're, they're terrible. Uh, <laughs> but like the, the best thing that I had going for me when I was like 16, 17 is that I didn't care at all what anybody thought of my songs because I wrote them for mm. myself. And uh, so this guy, he wrote this YouTube video and it was um, a challenge to himself to write 30 songs in 30 days, every day. Oh, wow. song. And he said the first thing that he, he figured out was if he had to deliver this thing, eventually he stopped caring about what it sounded like. Not, not, not what it sounded like, but he stopped yeah, caring yeah. about whether it was truly good or not. Yeah, yeah. And he just did it, got it done, moved on. Um, I thought it was just great advice. Yeah, yeah. Just, just do it. Just do it, and, and don't <laughs> care what. Uh, I, I know it's easy to say, like, don't care what other people think. But if you do it for yourself and you do it for your own enjoyment, then then it, yeah, what everyone else thinks is secondary to it. That's I I can't agree more, Theo. This was really awesome. I really enjoyed our talk, and I'm very sure that everyone um, <clears throat> who's watching this will be getting a lot out of it. Thank you so much, Theo. Awesome. Thanks, Young. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, of course.